Welcome to Back to the Bible. Just as seasons change in nature, we also experience changing seasons within ministry. Today, Back to the Bible begins such a season with our new speaker, Pastor Brian Clark. Brian is a highly respected and experienced clergyman, having pastored churches for over 36 years, including Lincoln Berean Church, where he now serves in his 26th year as senior pastor. His longtime relationship with Back to the Bible is quite unique, as he is the son of former Back to the Bible music director Eugene Clark. Brian and his wife Patty of 38 years enjoy spending time with their family, including three grown daughters and a young granddaughter. Today, Brian begins a series called An Unshakable Foundation. In it, he taps into the ancient wisdom of God's Word to help you build a foundation for your faith that cannot be shaken. Later in the program, Brian will be joined by Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole and author Kara Whitney to answer questions and lay out practical steps for growing closer to Christ. Now let's go to Brian Clark for today's Back to the Bible study. There is no more significant uh, foundational belief that anyone holds than your belief related to the first five words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. And either we believe that or we do not believe that, but it basically affects all of the other beliefs that we hold. It's like a domino effect. Believing what we believe about our origin then affects all of our other beliefs. Now, there are those who would tell you that this is really a debate between faith and fact, but that is certainly not the case. There are also those who would say this is a debate between religion and science, but that is also certainly not true. It is a collision of worldviews. There are two worldviews. One is the one espoused in the first chapter of Genesis, and that is that God is the center of everything. And God is the divine creator, and we will give an account to God, and God is at the center. The other worldview is a belief that mankind, or what most would say matter, is at the center of the universe. Therefore, we are the center. We can rewrite the rules. We can basically do as we please, and we answer to no one. Charles Darwin clearly understood what he was saying when he espoused his theory. Listen to what he says in his own words in his autobiography. A man who has no assured or ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. Darwin clearly understood that his theory allowed people to do whatever they felt like doing and they would answer to no one. And that is the collision of worldviews that is debated today. It's interesting to think about how profoundly your view considering your origin affects our beliefs concerning every major topic of discussion in our culture. Think with me a little bit about several of the, the most discussed topics in our culture today and think about how profoundly they're affected depending upon whether we believe that we are the center of the universe or whether we believe that God is the center of the universe. Take, for example, the discussion concerning purpose and meaning in life. This is a big discussion these days because a lot of people feel that there is no meaning, there is no purpose. It's reflected in music, it's reflected in books and magazines and movies. As a matter of fact, the one common thread with all of these sh uh, school shootings, and shootings that go on in malls and places of business is that all of these people that commit these crimes are people whose lives are characterized by despair. They're characterized by hopelessness. They're not just going in to kill someone. They, in the end, will kill themselves because there is nothing to live for. And if the theory of evolution is true, they are correct. There is no meaning and purpose in life. The only meaning in life would be something that is contrived, something that we just made up because the reality would be we are freaks of nature, we are here by chance. 
But if it's true that we are created by God, then we are created on purpose, for a purpose. There is a meaning to life, there is purpose to life, and God defines what that is. Take another topic that's hotly debated right now, and that is the whole issue related to marriage. There's a lot of people discussing in the media, does marriage mean one man with one woman, or can it mean two men or two women? And typically when it's debated, it's debated on the basis of, of tradition. It's, it's on the basis of our founding fathers and those type of arguments. And that's probably adequate if we are here by chance. We're just making up the rules as we go. But if there is a creator God, then we would say, then this God has created marriage. This God has defined marriage. It is not up to us to redefine that. The, the discussions related to homosexuality would also come back to this. Uh, discussions related to racism, for example. If the theory of evolution is true, then the natural conclusion of that is that there are people at the highest end of the gene pool and people at the lowest end of the gene pool. And if you read Darwin's writings carefully, it is the responsibility of those at the highest end to eliminate those at the lowest end to uh, produce a higher race. Adolf Hitler carefully studied the writings of Darwin, and that was a major motivational belief that led him to do what he did. That is a natural conclusion of that theory. But if we believe that there is a creator God who has created all people in God's image, all of us equal, we have a foundational philosophical belief whereby we can do away with racism. Well, you could talk about crime and punishment. You could talk about abortion and euthanasia. You could talk about uh, capital punishment. You could talk about uh, welfare reform. All of these, they are discussed at the topical level, but when you cut through the topic, you get down to the foundational beliefs. It does come down to whether or not we believe the first five words of the Bible are true or not true. I mentioned before that this is not a discussion of fact versus faith. As a matter of fact, if you carefully study the facts, the facts support Genesis chapter 1 and they discredit the theory of evolution. It is not a discussion of religion versus science because if you study science Thoroughly, you find that science supports Genesis chapter 1 and it discredits the theory of evolution. It is a collision of world views. Francis Bacon once made a very interesting statement. He said, a little science estranges man from God. A lot of science brings him back. That is very true. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. I mentioned before that this is not a discussion of fact versus faith. As a matter of fact, if you carefully study the facts, the facts support Genesis chapter 1 and they discredit the theory of evolution. It is not a discussion of religion versus science, because if you study science thoroughly, you find that science supports Genesis chapter 1, and it discredits the theory of evolution. It is a collision of world views. Genesis chapter 1 really isn't a chapter about science. It is a chapter about theology. Most all scholars agree that the book of Genesis is the foundational book in the Bible. They also agree that chapters 1 through 11 are the foundational chapters of the book of Genesis. They also agree that chapter 1, verse 1, is the foundational verse of the first 11 chapters. With all of that said, then the case can be made that Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is the foundational verse in the Bible. It's from that verse that the entire scripture builds upon. 
it is highly significant. Because if that is true, then the rest simply falls into place very naturally. One of the things in the text itself to notice that helps us understand that when Moses wrote chapter 1 of Genesis, it is not written as an argument. It is not written as an apologetic. Nobody is trying to prove the existence of God in the Bible. As a matter of fact, there is just an assumption that God is and that God created. This is fact. It is stated as fact. And the rest of the teaching rolls right out of that because God doesn't prove himself to anyone. God simply is. And that is the flavor of Genesis chapter 1. When you look through the chapter, notice that every single verse in this chapter begins with the word and or the word then. Now, it's helpful to know that both of those words are translations of the same Hebrew word. In other words, every verse in this chapter, except for verse 1, starts with the same Hebrew word, and that's a word we translate either and or then. Either word works fine because it's simply saying if verse 1 is true, then everything just simply rolls out of that verse. And this, and this, and that, then this, then that, and that's the way the whole chapter is written. That would be a technique to point us right back to verse 1 to say, this is really the verse, and the rest of this is a natural outflow of the truth of that statement. With that in mind, I'd like to read the first 23 verses and listen for that technique, the way that it's recorded here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them, on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit, with seed in them, after their kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening. And there was morning a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. It's obvious from this chapter that if Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is true, then everything just naturally flows out of that. Up next, Brian Clark joins Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole and author Kara Whitney in the studio for some candid conversation about today's message. Brian, thanks for a really great message. 
One of the things you brought up today is that none of the writers of the Bible were ever trying to prove the existence of God. So how do we respond to people today who want that proof? Well, I think it's a great question. If you start with the assumption that God doesn't have to prove anything, God is. And so the Bible is God's self-revelation. And so God exists and he's revealing himself. I think there's a level of people that ask for proof, but they don't really want it. It's just their way of avoiding God for one reason or another. But I think there's another layer of people there. They're hurting, they're seeking, they're trying to figure it out. Maybe they've been taught something their whole life, and now they're wondering if it's true. And I think for those people, the evidence is there. At the end of the day, it does require faith. But every view concerning the origin of the universe requires faith. So it comes down to, well, faith in what? So when you're thinking about the existence of God, how do we go about that? What would be the appropriate measurement? And I think in this case, it would be like a lawyer in a courtroom presenting evidence, and you weigh the evidence and you arrive at your conclusion. Some people refer to the evidence as as clues for God. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that we can look at and measure and determine if it's more reasonable to believe in the beginning God Or is it more reasonable to believe something came from nothing? Is it more reasonable to believe the universe created itself? That isn't science. Those are faith statements. And so we present the evidence, and people have to decide what they believe to be true. Right. But if the theory of evolution runs so contrary to science, why do so many people believe it? I think in a lot of ways, at the core, it's my desire to be my own god, And so the idea that there is no God kind of frees me from responsibility and answering to God, so then we can kind of make it up as we go. And so there's a part of evolution that supposedly is rooted to science, but there's a lot of it that's rooted to what we'll talk about in Genesis 3, and that's my desire to be my own God, which is the greatest temptation we have as people made in the image of God. Right. So part of the irony is it's only because people are made in the image of God that they can convince themselves there is no God. So how do grandparents, um, parents even, or what questions could they ask their kids or how could they get them thinking in another direction? So you can say, well, you know, that's a theory, but there's these things too for you to consider. You know, is there some way to open that dialogue up? Well, my kids all went to public school, Mm -hmm. and I was very happy when they came home with with those conversations because it was a chance for me to enter into the conversation of this is what other people believe, this is why they believe it, but this is what we believe, and this is why we believe it. I'd rather have those conversations with my kids when they're young than wait till they go to college and are suddenly overwhelmed by things they've never heard of before. Right. So part of, I think, the answer to your question is we as parents and grandparents need to be better equipped ourselves to have those conversations and and then enter in, ask lots of questions, enter in. And part of what we're teaching our kids is how to process information that may not necessarily be true. I mean, their whole life's going to be about being bombarded by lies and how to discern the truth. And that it's okay to ask questions. As Christians, yeah. it's okay even for believers, full lifelong believers, ask questions because there's so much awesomeness in truth. I know uh, we do it, and it leads into great discussions with my kids. Yeah. So I think what, one of the things that comes up with that, Kara, is you can't do that in the fast lane. Families are so busy. Mm-hmm. Where, where do we have those kind of conversations? Uh, I mean, really honest, meaningful conversations, you you just can't do that rushing from here to there. So if we're serious about having those conversations with our kids and grandkids, there has to be time to slow down and do that. So Brian, ever since I've known you, you've loved teaching Genesis. You talk about Genesis. Why is that so critical? Why can't I just skip it with the kids, you know, say, oh, that's theory. It's all theory. Just believe God. You know, why is Genesis so important? That's a great question, Arnie, because 
it is foundational to everything else we believe. It's, it's foundational within our culture. Do we believe God created? And the implications of that are then God is in charge, and God has defined the purpose of life. God has defined morality. God has defined marriage and, and intimacy and sexuality. All these things are ultimately defined by either God created or we're here by chance. Therefore, we're just making this up as we go. There is no meaning and purpose. We're free to redefine marriage and all these other topics. So if you take really every social topic, issue that comes up, it roots back to Genesis chapter 1. Do you believe we're here by chance and we're just making it up as we go, or do you believe that there is a creator God? So it's foundational, really, to everything we believe. So that's why it can't just be pushed aside. This is encouraging, and this is why I'm so thankful for good Bible teaching from you, Brian, because I think we get intimidated by Genesis because there's so many different views about it in theologies. But at the core, what you're saying is that this is the foundational piece, and that's what everything hinges on, this truth that we came from God. I think it's really helpful to remind ourselves both sides of this debate are making faith statements. It's not faith versus science. It's either by faith do you believe the universe created itself, or by faith do you believe in the beginning God, which to you sounds more reasonable. Both of those are faith statements. So it's it's important to understand that the issue is not science. It's none of us were there at the beginning. Right. So how did it all start? You know, this isn't a game to God. He's not hiding. Romans 1 says that on the basis of creation, God has made himself evident. So this isn't like a game of where's Waldo and people are trying to find God. If people are genuinely seeking, God wants to be known. He gave up his own son to die for them. Then God meets them there and reveals himself. And at the end of the day, that's what brings the confidence in the heart of the believers. God lives within us. Well, if, I think if he went and put a huge fireball in the sky, is that coercing us at that point then? Or does he give us just enough information to convince us without forcing us into a relationship with him out of fear? Here's one to think about. What if God actually took on human flesh and walked among us? Certainly that would be convincing. What a it? crazy deal mm. that would be. Still. And I'm very sure undeserving, everybody too. would believe if he right. would have done that. <laughs> Still they doubt. Certainly. Mm. Thanks for listening today. Please join us again tomorrow for more encouragement from God's Word here on Back to the Bible.